On this week's episode, we talk about the worst episode of The Office, using awkwardness as your superpower, and who should pay on a first date. Welcome to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. I'm your host, Matchmaker Maria, and this week I have a really awkward guest. Her name is Hannah Pryor, and her book just came out on September 26th called Good Awkward. You have to buy it. It is amazing. And the link is in the show notes. Hannah, welcome to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. Thank you for having me. I love being introduced as the, the awkward guest of the day. Let's of course. Go. There's no way I'm the first person to no. introduce you like that. No. Unfortunately, I've been known as that for most of my life. <laughs> so yes. So you have spoken on the TEDx stage twice. You do wor keynotes worldwide. You're an international superstar. And you've just written a book about being awkward. Yes. And using that as your superpower. Correct. Tell me, uh, what makes you an expert in awkwardness? Yeah, I love that. The awkwardness expert. So where this all came from is despite what you think you hear or see right now, I have been awkward my entire life. You sure. know, child of immigrants. I know a lot of us know that story. My mm -hmm. food didn't smell like everyone else's. My clothes didn't look like everyone else's. What kind of food did you... Uh... Kima paratha. What it's, is that? It's like minced ground beef with spices and stuff. And my mom would put it in the metal tins. Sure. You know, and everybody else had their cool little PB&J on white bread sandwich. And I was like, Ugh, I, I want that. I hear your, what did you call it? Kima. I hear your Kima and I raise you a fakes. Oh, that's a good name. I know. Isn't that a perfect <laughs> name? Fakes is lentil soup with a little bit of feta on top. Your friends must have loved that. Dude, I got made fun of just like you. They were <laughs> all it. their PB&J. You know what's funny is at some point my parents started Mereda was very popular, which is essentially Nutella. It's like the Greek version of Nutella. Right. Hazelnut spread. Yeah. And they'd be like, are you eating caca sandwiches? <laughs> and now these Poop bitches sandwich. are eating Nutella for breakfast. I, I'm eating Nutella for breakfast. So, <laughs> so haters can hate, but that's just delicious. Yes. So. so anyway, you grew up as an immigrant child. It did. In, in Delaware. In Delaware. Um, they, you know, there's a decent population of brown kids, but not at my school. I was like okay. the only one. And honestly, it was just, you know, like many kids that grew up like we did, I am henna. I wasn't Jennifer or Samantha. I was sure. born in the early 80s. And I'm like, just want to be Jennifer. Jessica, why am I henna in the era of Hannah Barbera? You know, that was rough. And <laughs> over and over, the me that I wanted to be was constantly clashing with the me who was on display. Okay. And I felt awkward about it the entire time, the entirety of my childhood. It wasn't until college that I finally kind of was like, okay, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And I feel like brown that. girls, though, in general, do have this sort of pep in their step once they get to college, especially yeah. millennials and Gen X, where you're socialized your whole life to think you're ugly, right? Yeah. Not, And you're not, by the way. Thank you. And most women <laughs> Just, are not. Right. What I'm saying is that, like, you're seeing on TV, like, a lot of whiteness. Right. Right? Right. And there is this sort of awkwardness that kind of takes place. I mean, I'm, I grew up in a predominantly South Asian town. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Middlesex County. And um, and as a result, you know, like I remember what it looked like for my peers. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly when you go to college and, you know, now you can wear makeup because yeah. a lot of brown parents don't allow makeup when yeah, you're in high yeah, school, yeah. right? Or my suddenly, shoulders showing. <laughs> yeah, suddenly. And you get like a little boost of confidence. Suddenly it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And that's it. I think that conditioning of I didn't see people who looked like me in a magazine. Mm -hmm. I didn't see people who looked like me on TV. So now, I mean the Mindy Kalings of the world, the, all these beauty brands that Make have come space. out. Oh my God. I mean, what is this world that we now live in? I would have died to have this as yeah. a kid. I mean, but, there's a Jonas brother married to a yeah, brown girl. Yeah. I was going to say the one's not married to the other one anymore, but that one's still married to the brown girl. Yes. Yeah. Correct. I love that. Yes. I love that too. Um, okay. So you're an expert in awkwardness. You are a, you're a certified coach. Yeah. Certified executive coach. And just the, the interest in this, you know, was I awkward my whole life? Yes. I don't think that makes me an expert. I think that what actually made this uh, an interesting vocation for me was uh, Brene Brown is very popular in the development sure. space. You know, vulnerability is part of relationships. We know this. And she would say at the end of her podcast, stay awkward, brave, and kind. Mm. Right? If you're trying to connect with people, stay awkward, brave, and kind. And I remember thinking, I know how to stay brave. My parents taught me that one. I know how to stay kind. Yep, that tracks. Stay awkward. I've been trying to fight that my whole life. What's this lady talking about? Right? right. I don't want to stay awkward. And so I got curious about it. And then I started getting into the research, started interviewing people, and I just I learned a whole lot. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like the feeling of awkwardness, that is universal. 100%. I think people think of the most confident person they know, whether it's in a business context, in the dating scene, and they're like, that person, they must never really feel like this. They figured it out. 
There is not a person alive that does not experience this emotion, unless you're you know, a bit of a sociopath and you don't experience emotion at all. Sure. But this is universal. The most confident people you know haven't avoided it. They haven't figured out how to get rid of it. They've learned how to embrace it and move through it quickly. That's the only difference. But is awkwardness learned? It is. So awkwardness is a self-conscious emotion. Okay. So meaning uh, it's, it's a social emotion. We don't experience it by ourselves. So if you call somebody by the wrong name when you're sitting at home, you know, just practicing something out loud, nobody saw you. You don't typically feel awkward about it. We feel awkward when something happens in front of other people. Okay. It's a social emotion. And ultimately, the, the working definition I use is that awkwardness is the emotion we feel when the person we believe ourselves to be, mm. our true self, is at odds with the person that for a moment they see on display. Okay, so that's the kind of working definition. When we say is awkwardness learned, it's something that develops around age eight or nine. So you'll notice if you have kids in your life, neighbors, kids, mm -hmm. nieces, nephews, if they're under age eight, they don't really feel awkward. They don't care who's looking because they haven't yet started to realize, oh, are other people approving of me? Do they care what I'm doing? And so we, we learn it in early adolescence. What is the Venn diagram here of like awkwardness and embarrassing? Mm -hmm. So very closely related. So awkwardness, again, it's if in the working definition we're going to use is these two selves being at odds. Usually embarrassment by definition is a little more fleeting. So most people, again, not everyone, but most people don't refer to themselves as I'm an embarrassment. Uh, Usually it's more I was embarrassed for a second and or I was embarrassed for a few minutes and I'm still thinking about it. Yeah. But it tends to be more fleeting. The difference with awkwardness is that it sometimes can be fleeting. Yeah. Ooh, that was an awkward conversation. That was an awkward date. That was an awkward negotiation. But some people, a lot of people, refer to themselves as awkward as a trait. Like I am I'm awkward. socially awkward. I am socially awkward. I, this is just who I am. I'm so awkward. And that's where we start to get into trouble because it's hard to move through that when you use it as an identity. Tell me more about that. So language matters, right? So language matters. Here's what's interesting about awkwardness is there's no such thing as a factually awkward person. Right. By definition, there's no such thing as a factually awkward person. It's up to us to deem them so or to deem, deem ourselves so. Exactly. It's subjective. It's an opinion. Right. So if we start from that knowing that, hey, this isn't a statement of fact. If you call yourself awkward, guess what? That's your opinion of yourself. Yeah. If someone else calls you that. It's your opinion of yourself. And what's difficult is when we call ourselves that as a trait, it doesn't leave much room for embracing it or moving through it. It becomes mm -hmm. a crutch. It's a box. This is who we are. This is how I show up. If we change our language to instead of I am awkward, well, I'm going on this date with this new person. I don't know them and I feel pretty awkward about it. That's temporary. That's something we can move through. That's something we can put strategy to. But when we use it as a trait, it's limiting. It makes it hard for us to be the person we want to be. Do you think, um, you know, it's funny. I'm listening to you speak and I just thought about yesterday, my son. Okay, let me tell you what's been happening this week in my life. Okay. We got a wasp infestation. Oof. And we had to move into a hotel until they like take down a wall and take out the nest, which they did, by the way. Today they yeah. took out the nest. We're finally in the clear. Thank God we don't have to fumigate the whole home house. All right. But anyway, so yesterday was my husband's birthday. And, you know, this was not how I planned it. I did not plan to be at an embassy Boston suite yeah. in central Jersey. Um, yeah. So we, but we tried to make the best of it. And I got a cake from like our favorite bakery and I got a balloon and we went to the hotel restaurant. And my son, who's five, he's like, oh, this is going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> And I was like, how do you even know that word? Yeah. Like, I didn't even, I never thought of, and then it just made me think like, oh, I guess next year he won't want to hold our hands. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, now like now I'm giving you like my thought process. It's like, oh, and then where does that turn into awkward? Yeah. So generally speaking, again, most children don't start to become super conscious of it until closer to eight or nine. But that said, we now live in a world where Younger children are seeing these messages from their friends on, you know, media, on, on social media, if they have cousins that are older, right? So there's lots of places where they could be hearing this language. Right. But ultimately, where awkwardness becomes something that requires a closer look is when it causes inaction. Mm. So awkwardness is a normal emotion. We talked about it at the beginning. It's a universal emotion. No one gets to avoid it because to avoid awkwardness implies eliminating all uncertainty in life. It implies okay. knowing exactly how your life is going to go, how someone else is going to react to you, which if somebody has figured that out, I would love to know. But right. as far as I know, nobody's cracked that code. And so when we start to experience awkward moments, essentially what we're doing is we're scanning our environment and saying, 
do other people approve of who they see right now? And we start to behave in ways that are in line with not who we are, but who we hope other people see, right? And that's where we start to get those two selves at odds. Now, interestingly, again, the messages we receive, they play a really big part in this. So if we start to hear these messages over and over, somebody doesn't approve of what they see, we're like, oop, check mark, they don't like that, they didn't like when I made that joke, they didn't like when I wore those clothes. When those messages repeat over time, we start to become very conditioned mm. to look for who we are through the lens of who other people see. And when we don't examine those messages, that likelihood of feeling awkward just gets higher and higher. Which part of awkward then is cringe? Mm. Cringe is just a word to describe a, a visceral body feeling. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. I mean, we can use it. Think things can be cringy. What's right? the cringiest thing that's ever happened to you? Oh, God. <laughs> name them. I don't know. I, uh, I've been – I've called leaders the wrong name. I, you know, I've given presentations. Actually, I remember I gave a presentation once, and it was about something relating to public speaking. Yeah. And in giant letters – I mean, giant. It was on a screen the size of – you know, bigger than this room. I didn't put the L in the word public. <laughs> and so in giant letters behind me, it said pubic speaking. Sure. And I'm like, yeah. mm, and here I am teaching them about – right? I'm the expert. Right. So again, awkwardness, who I am versus who they see. Here I am trying to be the expert right. on public speaking. Who they see is who <laughs> she can't even write. She can't even type, right? I was flushed. I was embarrassed. I had to move through it. Um, one of my favorite examples from the book is, I remember when we all came back from the pandemic, sure. I did a giant pitch meeting for the first time in a while. We hadn't seen people in person. So I give this guy 15 minutes of my giant pitching, you know, my best sales pitching. And he puts his hand up and I'm like, Nailed it, right? Nailed it. So I give him a high five because he put no. his hand up. And he goes, I have a question. Hannah, I was telling you to stop. Oh. Oh. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> like, why? My God, just remove me from this situation, right? Right. Full body embarrassment, cringe, you know, all the time. The cringiest thing that's ever happened to me was me watching the Scott's Tots episode of The Office. <laughs> yes. Or Diversity Day. That's the other one. I'm okay with Diversity Day. Yeah. But like, because it's like the beginning. Yeah. It's like, I'm yeah. still trying to figure out what the show is. Yeah. Scott's Tots, that's an attack. And I would love if I wish Netflix or Peacock or whoever has The Office would just like release the data because I really believe that that's their least watched episode. Yeah. Yeah. Like, can I tell you why? I'm actually really glad you brought this up. Is this in your book? This is in my book. So the reason you had such a strong reaction to that is actually one of the most fascinating pieces of research I came across in the book is there's a phenomenon called vicarious embarrassment. So this is something that you experience when you are a little high on a certain type of empathy. So the certain type of empathy is called easily empathetically embarrassed. So some people who rate high on a certain type of empathy, easily empathetically embarrassed, will watch shows like that. There's actually a genre name for it. It's called cringe comedy. So The Office, Borat, Curb Your Enthusiasm, America's Funniest Home Videos. Some people can watch those shows and they can you know, feel a little bit of embarrassment for another person, but sure. they can laugh and they think it's hilarious. Other people, I sense you, will take it on as though it's their own. They are literally embarrassed with other people, right? They, they have this full body like... I just need to go into the comforter right now. I cannot I even handle. I was like, yeah. I've only watched it once. And funny enough, like a year ago, I was flipping through the channels and the office was on. There was like a cold open that I, I was like, yeah. is this like a deleted scene? How have <laughs> I never seen this cold open? It was the cold open from Scott's Tots that I just completely forgot about yeah. because I've only watched that episode once. Yeah. And because like, you can't handle it. Right? No, I can't. Yeah. I physically cannot handle it. Yeah. So here's an interesting correlation. And this isn't everyone, but a lot of people who have strong levels of vicarious embarrassment, who really cannot tolerate things like this, unfortunately, tend to feel a little more awkward themselves in difficult situations because yeah. when they feel so strongly about someone else's embarrassment, they tend to think that other people are looking at them with that same intensity, hmm. that same feeling when they have a similar situation. So again, it's not every single person. Some people can watch that stuff, feel it in the moment and go, it's TV and move on. Other people, they hold on to it so intensely and it actually becomes a barrier to them managing their own feelings of awkwardness or embarrassment when they come up. That's so fascinating to me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think one of the most common questions that I receive on Wednesdays, on Ask a Matchmaker Wednesdays, mm -hmm. um, is about like who pays. Mm -hmm. Now you and I, you're gonna have to tell me, okay, before you answer about who, before we talk about the awkwardness of that social 
uh, environment yep. of dating, right? Because sure. dating in itself is the most it's awkward. The sure. most awkward, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know what's more awkward than dating? What's that? Sex. Yes. Yeah, and that. that's like plus one, <laughs> plus five. It's like sometimes I think about it, yeah. like like post sex, and I'm like that. That yeah. yeah, it's funny. And now that I have thirteen and eleven year old, they're like, "You do what and why?" Yeah. And I'm like, "It does." It, now that you say it like that, yeah. Oh my god, I kiss my husband on the lips, and my kids are like, Ew. Ugh, "Mine too." <laughs> like they want to gag, and I'm like, "All right, gross, settle down." Until you hear about other things. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, so I get this question from women like, "Who pays?" Yeah, and men. You know, it's funny. Men have never asked me this question. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm just always wondering, like. Is awkwardness in this situation, because I think that's what it is, mm -hmm. um, where is it coming from? Because I feel like we do have a general idea of who might pay based on the status quo. Yes. Yes. So there's another sort of framing of awkwardness that I think would be useful here. Awkwardness also, again, it exists in uncertainty. And it also exists when we are setting expectations, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, and those expectations aren't met. Mm. So, for example, let's say the woman who is kind of hoping for this chivalrous, you know, situation where the man offers, she's kind of setting a mental expectation, whether she realizes it or not, that he's going to reach for the wallet. And when that expectation isn't met, it creates awkwardness, right? Or vice versa. He thinks, hey, this is a modern day woman. She's going to offer to split and she doesn't offer that up. And then all of a sudden this kind of in between silent who's going to go where creates that awkward situation. So whether we realize it or not, society creates expectations. And when those expectations don't hit the way that we expect them to, right. we experience awkwardness. So how do we circumvent that awkward? Because I have yeah. a solution in my mind, yeah. but I would love to hear from yeah. the awkward expert, <laughs> um, you know, how do you circumvent feeling? Because those are negative emotions in my eyes. Sure. And of maybe, maybe they're not. They maybe are. awkwardness is no, not. No, awkordness is an emotion of discomfort. I okay. Mean, it is, it's a self-conscious emotion, and I would be lying to say self-consciousness feels good. Right. right. Typically, we're full of doubt. We're full of imposter thoughts. We're full of, I don't know what to, to feel right now, right? So it is an uncomfortable emotion. Um, I'm guessing that your advice is probably going to be the same as mine, but the research supports that. So interestingly, the avoidance of awkwardness increases awkwardness. Okay. So when we're kind of playing this game of who's going to pull out the wallet or who's going to offer, when we're all like sitting in that a little longer, the avoidance of it actually increases it and it okay. just ratchets up. So the absolute best thing you can do in that situation is name it, is to immediately put it into the room, put it into the air of, well, this is awkward because now we're at the pay part of this. Oh, and we you don't would know. say that? Yeah. Is, that's cringe. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Because here's the thing. Everyone's thinking it. And by putting it in the room of, you know, hey, this is, it feels a little cringy right now, but I'm just going to throw this out there. How are we doing this pay thing? Right? Like just to own it, because here's the truth. Everyone is feeling it in that moment. And all it takes is that first person to normalize it and put it in the room. And I have seen this over and over. Everyone's shoulders immediately go down. Everyone relaxes. If you don't want to name it outright, using a little bit of strategic humor around it goes a long way because ultimately the goal is to just pop that tension balloon. Say it one more time. So the bill comes. The bill comes. And I think, you know, just some version of, okay, this is a little awkward right now because this is the pay moment of the the date and neither of us quite know what to do. Did you have an idea around this? Or just naming I the fact that this is- I would never do this. You know, a lot- Let's of, talk, hold on a second. Yes. When you went on your first date with your spouse, and the bill came on your first date. Yeah. What happened? Be honest. I mean, it was forever ago. But honestly, uh, I think in his case, I don't think I had to navigate that situation because he reached right away. Uh, uh, mm, there you right. go. Like, yeah. like I, I refuse to. Yes. Equality. Woohoo! Right. Sure. Okay. This costs a lot of money. Mm. Okay. So here's another perspective. Right. Hold on. Go ahead. Hold go on, ahead. Go ahead. On. Yeah. This costs like a lot of, I'm not saying he owes me something. Sure. All right. What I'm saying is that I come from a culture where if I ever said to a Greek man, mm. so how are we going to take care of this? Or yeah. do you need help with that? Or if I even pretended to go for my wallet, there would be like offense. It would be offense. Yes. Right. Yes. Because it doesn't matter if I ask them out. It's kind of like, well... I want to take out a beautiful woman today. Sure. And I'm going to yeah. pay for this. Yeah. Right? Like that sort of mentality. Like it's it's my honor to take out this beautiful woman. Sure. And in my view, again, this is my personal view. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but also professional view because I've set up 6,000 first dates and I can literally think in like three scenarios where they split the check. Right. Sure. Um, it's like if a guy enjoyed your company and he wants to see you again. Yeah. There's no, Price there is no awkwardness. <laughs> yeah. There's like, oh yeah, let me get that. Yeah. Like, Cause they want to show off that they're, they, they, they know the status quo. So I, I, I love this. Like I think chivalry is have, you know, long overdue for some sort of return, right? So what I would offer there is maybe what I was hearing from you was we're in this situation where we're just all kind of looking at each other and there's dead air passing and now we're not sure who's supposed to grab. Now, if this was me truly, if I was, you know, expecting that or hoping for that or assuming that that was going to happen and some time was ticking by, I probably would have employed the same strategy. What I said would have probably been a little different about like, okay, so been a few seconds, so it's kind of awkward, but I'm hoping that, you know, you enjoy this enough that you're grabbing dinner tonight, right? But been playful about it, not pointed about it. It's right. not meant to be an accusation, but by saying, hey, it's a little awkward, but just assuming you've got this, right? Look, you know, if you've got this cute dress on, you got this tonight, right? But it's, it's the humor, it's the playfulness, it's the lightness. I feel like I would matters. just say to someone, like if there was so many seconds have passed in the bill and they haven't even touched it, I'd be like, well, thank you so much for dinner. <laughs> exactly. Sure. Like, I'm not even, it's so funny. Like I think it's so, it's so interesting to me. And I, and I don't, I'm not saying this that I think you're wrong. I don't think yeah. you're wrong at all. But you know what I think about is like, if I were out to lunch with you and the bill sure. came. Yeah. Um, I don't care about impressing you. So this is, I want to just call this out. I would out never be think, like, oh, this is really awkward. Who's going to pay No, this? but I love that you're at this point. And I think this is what I've learned in the research, that you are grounded enough in what you want and what you deserve and what you are looking for from an interaction that you are able to say, thank you so much for that dinner, right? You're able to yeah. kind of say that tongue in cheek. I mean, cheek. I had to learn it. Yes. And that's the key, right? So a lot of this is conditioning. And so I'm so, I love that you're a model of, I hope every one of your listeners at that point would be like, Thank you for dinner. And right? what I said before about like this is expensive, what I I really want yeah. to clarify that, right? Most heterosexual men, mm -hmm. they can say they want like the 50-50, but many of them will not date the woman that's just like them. Like yeah. for the most part, men are paying maybe for its beat stick. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like yeah. I don't know that many men that put cream on their face. Right, right. Like the grooming is not the same. Right, right. Right. Meanwhile, sure. you know, you want a hairless Greek goddess, <laughs> which is like an oxymoron. Yeah, this costs like twelve thousand. You don't want my eyebrows to connect, no? Yeah, That's you don't not, want yeah. this. I have a mustache. <laughs> I, I I literally um Solidarity pluck a, a my I have a beard. Like Girl, this costs I'm thousands Pakistani. Of I, I got, so you get it. I get right? it. I get it. Um and yeah. then you know, like the blowouts, like it's like, oh yeah, I, I love when men say <laughs> oh my god at work. I'll hear a guy say to me, like, I want a woman who's like doesn't wear a lot of makeup. Yeah, get out of here. And I'm like, can you show me a photo of someone who doesn't wear a lot of makeup? And they're showing me like Mila Kunis. And right. I'm like, natural. Mila looking Kunis makeup. literally has like yeah. A, a whole a pack. Face full like, of show me makeup. Black China. Black China's not wearing makeup right now. Show me her. Yeah. You know, but yeah. like, don't show me Mila Kunis. No. She, she, all she's, all she's, the whole Mila, I think what confuses men is the eyeliner. Yes, yes, yeah. And natural makeup. They don't understand natural makeup. Yeah, they don't understand that. Yeah. For Mila Kunis to look Mila Kunis, it took yes. like an hour. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly right. So, uh, but yeah. So, all right, I have a case study for you about this paying. I love it. Let's do it. So somebody texted me today, and I love that this happened. It was like, it's like they knew. It's like they knew. And I was, I'm like, They obsessed. knew we were going to teach them about pubic speaking at oh, dinner. Oh, my God. And she's Indian, too. Perfect. Bless. This is amazing. All right. Ready? Yeah. Hi, Maria. This is, this is, okay. So I'm assuming, I don't know where this is, but this is in the morning, okay? Okay. Hey, Maria. It's my birthday today. Happy birthday. Going on a first date. Who is supposed to pay? First of all, yeah. people having first dates on their birthdays is wild to me. I had my first date on Valentine's Day with my husband by accident. But by yeah, accident. Yeah, I love that. It was by accident. That's happened to me before yeah, too. Yeah. I love that. All right. It, and she writes also, it's a bit urgent. So in my <laughs> mind, I'm picturing this person's getting ready and is like, she's like, do I bring my wallet or not? <laughs> Oops, I forgot my wallet. Um, and I just reply back, the guy. Guy pays for first dates, period. That's all I wrote. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. No, I love it. Um, okay. She wrote, thank you. Do I even offer? Here's, I mean, here's the thing. I, I personally, and I, lo I love, I love your conviction in the way you look at things too. But I think this is where we sometimes may not always see it the same way. I think there are some women, modern day women, who would be offended by the insistence on paying. I've met those women. I, I do a lot with executive women leaders who uh -huh. are dating. 
they might take offense to the immediate, like not even acknowledging the fact that they might, might want to contribute, especially if they don't intend to go on a second date with this person. Oh, hold up. Hold on a second. Yeah. If you don't want to see the guy again, I fuck that 50 50. Right, right. You know, put that money down. That feels yeah. so good. So I think there's nuance, right? Yeah. Oh, like absolutely. I think it really depends and it's, absolutely. it's something 1, we have to examine situation by situation. So I wrote to her here, I suppose, only because it's her birthday and I'm kind of like, yeah. I would, I think it could be like, well, it's my birthday. Let me take care of it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. All right. And then she wrote, thank you. I didn't offer though, but I texted later for my share. Was it stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes. Awkward and amazing. And you're my hero. I love you. So, that. The next three questions are what? Three question marks. What did you do? Three question marks. Is this someone you know? No, oh. this is a stranger. Okay. And then I'm like, you texted for your share? Five question like, marks? Like, did she put a Venmo request? Like, please send me my, this is hilarious. That's what I asked. I said, I need a screenshot of what your, so she said, a friend suggested I do this. So I wrote, I need a screenshot of what your friend said and what you did. And she said, she was with me. I typed and confirmed with her. In the end, he asked me to just chill. So the message here, <laughs> she sent me the just screenshot. Chill. I'm going to have to include this on the, on the, the when notes. I put the show notes, but she wrote, texted him. Also, let me know the bill amount. I'll pay my share. Oh my gosh. This is hilarious. And his emoji is this. <gasps> <laughs> Dating is the most awkward. Oh my goodness. Which I, I feel for her. I do. But I think, you know, again, here's, you know, I, I my, and my, then she wrote here. Yeah. She wrote what you said. I don't like having this conversation at the restaurant. And all he wrote back was chill. Yeah. And um, and then I, I just asked her just really quick, what culture are you and him? Yeah. Because I don't know that this person. So she writes back that she's Indian and he, and then she also wrote, but he has been to U.S. and Mexico for a long time, if that makes a difference. So I will say it can make a difference. And I do want to actually point this nuance out because I think it's important. And, you know, you and I are, are women who have different you know cultural origin. And I think this does play a part because in certain cultures and for women and for women of color exclusively and, and more poignantly, awkwardness sometimes is not as appreciated as it is in men. So some of the things I learned in the book is, you know, look for examples of the successful female leader archetype that is also awkward. You know where you're going to see it? In comedy. Tina Fey, Mindy Kaling, uh, Aubrey Plaza, you know, Rebel Wilson. You don't tend to see the awkward business leader woman, but there's plenty of examples of the men of that. We've got the Zuckerbergs and the Elon Musks and all that. So there is a Still a lot of systemic stuff that has to be done. For women of color, confidence often needs to look like flawlessness, right? And for some cultures, growing up, showing your bumpy edges, showing your imperfections was seen as a sign of weakness. So, you yeah. know, I do want to be careful. We don't paint with a super broad brush here. Everybody's yeah. got different conditioning, different messages. It took me a long time to shake away the shackles of approval and let all my snort laughs and, you know, goofy edges show in settings that I used to think I couldn't because it would make me look a certain way. I remember seeing my big fat Greek wedding in the movie theaters. Me too. <laughs> and like that changed my life. Changed my life. And I'm really? not even Greek, but I was like, that's my family too. No, but it's like also like just kind of embracing the fact that, yeah, I was born with a unibrow and yeah, I have like a mustache and yeah, yeah. I have like chin, I have a beard. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say chin here. <laughs> I, I love it. Beard. I love it. Um, but like having these things and like, you know, and that my life, and I think this was like, the case for a lot of other people that have similar subcultures, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause I feel like South Asians and Greeks, same tree, just different branches. Sure. Yeah. Um, I felt like, Oh, this unique experience that I thought I was having is actually not that unique. Right. Sure. Agree. There's a whole movie about it. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why it was so popular. Yeah. In the U.S. You know what's funny, though? My Big Fat Greek Wedding, yeah. not popular at all in Greece. They were like, no. What, they don't were... understand it. They're yeah. like, why are you doing all this? Like, yeah. who is this? They don't get it because they're not in the diaspora. Sure. It's yeah. like if you go back to Pakistan. You said you're from Pakistan. Yeah, right? my, my mom's from Pakistan. My dad's from India, but we claim Pakistani. Fun. More. Yeah. Uh, that must be so much fun for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't fight. <laughs> it's fine. Um, but, like, if you go back to Pakistan, like, yeah. it's like... That's not, I can't be your core. Yeah, with my white husband here. named Ian, like the guy in Big Fat Greek Wedding, funny oh, enough. So. His name is Ian? Yeah, Ian. Yeah, yeah, the whole, yeah. Is he vegetarian? No, not at oh. all. <laughs> I mean. Actually, kind, oh, of, kind of this week he's trying it on, but no, he's. Are you vegetarian? Much. No. Oh. No, give me a good steak. I need a good steak. So what's interesting, I, I just want to maybe call out something that you said is, you know, for us, 
awkwardness was part of our cultural conditioning. Like we, yeah. we just kind of grew up in it. We didn't have to worry about it. What's what's interesting that a lot of the the stuff that came out for the research of the book is that not everyone, especially now, you know, younger generations, millennial Gen Z, do not have the same opportunities for this conditioning. We now live in this culture. You know why? I'd love to hear your take. Why? Um, have you seen these like 12 year olds with their makeup? Yeah. When I was 12, there was no such thing as primer. We didn't have YouTube. You just had to like figure it out and make mistakes. I'll I see photos my, I'll of I'll send myself. you my picture for the show notes. <laughs> I will need that. I, I look at photos of myself and I'm like 13 and I'm like, and we're from the same generation. So yeah. like I had the pencil thin eyebrows mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like the wrong stuff. And then I see yeah. now like teenagers and I'm like, you look like you're 24 and you're 14. Yeah. Like what? They don't they don't go through the social They don't go through the awkward anymore. stage. And, and, you know, they're growing up faster. But also we live in this culture and this society that is just optimized for smoothness. Yeah. We do not have to have awkward social conversations. I had to ring the doorbell when I went to my friend's house. Now you just sit in the driveway and you text here. Right? That's you don't it. Even call, remember you used to have to call your parents and be you like. Have to talk to your friend's parents on the phone. Hi, Mrs. What's your last yeah. name? Pry. Or, well, oh. my, my maiden name was Merchant. Oh, wait, Pryor is your Pryor is my name? married name. Merchant is my maiden name. Oh, fun. Yeah. So like, hi, Mrs. Merchant. Can I speak yeah. to Hannah? Yeah. It's like, yeah. you don't have that anymore. And then you have to make small talk like for a while until they come. And then, you know, it's even the little things like my kids will never have to walk to the front of the classroom and sharpen their pencil. Why not? Because they don't really do that. They do it like at the breaks or the teacher does it for them or whatever. You know, my husband the other day, this is like my, my recent story I keep sharing. We were going to order tacos and the toast tab like wasn't working. The website oh. was down. So he's like, well, where, where are we going to get food instead? And I was like, instead, I wanted tacos. We're going to call the restaurant. But it's just so easy now yeah. to avoid social interaction. And so our social musculature is weakening. So if that social musculature is weakening and you try to go on a date for the first time in a while, what do you think is going to happen? Oh, my God. You're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> so what can we do to make people feel like more cringe? Like do we yes. put like Scott's tots that is required mm -hmm. watching? Required, high required reading. Yeah. No, I love it. <laughs> so, you know, one of my assertions is this is not a lack of knowing. It's a lack of conditioning. So part of this is awareness. What are the messages you received growing up? What are the stories you tell yourself about your awkward situations? Do you say that they're uh, contamination stories essentially – I did that. It felt awkward. I'm never going to do it again. Mm. Or are they redemptive stories, meaning I can look for the upside. I put myself out there. I tried it. You know, what types of stories are you telling yourself? That's step one. Step two is conditioning. When the toast tab isn't working, call the restaurant. When your order, coffee order wasn't quite right, go up and tell them, hey, it's not quite right. We have gotten so far away from these intentional opportunities for social muscle building. So my kids... You know, I try as often as I can to give them opportunities for small social risk taking, you know, go up to the counter and ask for a napkin, have conversations with people that you don't know, right? This muscle is slowly dying in people and it's making it so much more challenging to have easy conversations, but especially difficult conversations of which dating, courting someone, <laughs> having a tough relationship conversation. These are the most awkward situations and our muscles need to be strong enough to handle them. If we're not having them in small stake situations, how the hell are we going to have them in the high stakes situation? Can you give my listeners, like, I have a challenge too, but maybe you have one too, like yeah. a challenge to like help build the social muscles so that they can withstand awkwardness only because I, as I'm listening to, I'm thinking about like, wow, we need to learn how to be awkward because if we're not awkward, how can we possibly be vulnerable in relationships? Because that's a requirement. Sure. No? Yeah. I love that you said that because awkwardness and vulnerability have a lot in common, but they're not the same. I In the book, I refer to awkwardness as a stepping stone, as an invitation to vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So vulnerability is higher on the scale of emotional exposure. So a lot in common, a little bit of you know risk, a little bit of social interaction, but vulnerability usually off offers more of that emotional, here's what I'm feeling, here's who I am. Awkwardness doesn't have to have all of that. It can be a little lower stakes, but... Simple exercises we can do. You know, one of our easiest ways to numb social friction is our handheld distraction monster, mm -hmm. right? Myself included. Next time you're in the grocery store line, keep it in your purse. Just keep mm. it in your pocket. Keep it, keep it away and just see what happens. Now, I'm not saying you need to go randomly start talking to the person in front of you, but if they catch your eye and smile, try on a, how you doing today? Like, we stop doing these things and it's insane. So if we can at least start to slowly build that back in our social environment, yeah. it makes it easier to strike up a conversation with the stranger that you go on a date with. Oh yeah. I would also even say like, um, 
I mean, I actually still do this, like say hi to people yeah. um, and tell them that they look cute when they look cute. Yes. Um, yes. You know, on my way here, I try to do this at least once a day. It really just like puts a pep in their step too. And it's like fun. It's, like, it's kind of fun like being the verbal Santa to someone. 100%. And it feels really good to the giver. You, once you start doing it, it's more it's rewarding addictive. for me. I My friend gave me the, the challenge of uh, I travel a lot for work. I'm a keynote speaker. So he says, every time you're in the TSA line, Try to yeah. really compliment them because these are people who do not get compliments. Yeah. People are, you know, that's are a good one. Grumpy. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for keeping us safe today. You look great today, right? Just like a couple words of affirmation. It makes their day. Right. And ultimately makes my day. Right. It feels so good. And it takes no effort, costs no money. It's something that, you know, the first couple of times I did it, I had to sort of muster uh -huh. the, the courage to do it. Once I did it, I'm like, what was I afraid of? This feels great. And it makes it so easy to do it in other moments. I mean, on my way here, I saw this gentleman wearing like a nice like pink shirt and I had to say, I was like, you look so cute today. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you, thank you, oh, thank you. And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, you're wearing green. So anytime I see a woman wear green, I always have to say something because yeah. of hashtag green theory, but you don't even know what that is because no. we got introduced to each other recently. by Fotini recently. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you don't know green no, theory. I don't know. Um, do you ever notice that people compliment you more when you're wearing green? All the green? time. Is there a thing about that? Yeah. That's hilarious. So green theory is, um, it's basically, it's like a, one of my findings of that for women, mm -hmm. it is the color of vitality and mm -hmm. personal ability. So what usually happens is men and women feel like you are open to mm. conversation and that, and you know, green looks amazing on most people people yeah um so it's like you get kind of welcomed it's like kind of like wearing a clown hat but you look good like you can't blow my mind right that. now because every yeah. time i wear green people have a i got my shoes on i got my cool kicks on with the yeah. green bottom every time i wear green people comment on it and it's never occurred to me that that is the case until you yeah. just said it and the equivalent for men is um light purple and pink or salmon. Right. Um, yeah, any, okay. And it's true because anytime I see a gentleman wear light purple or pink, I have to say something. Like yeah. I just gave that example. I have to say something. But also the reason for that now for women commenting on a man wearing light purple or pink, um, in that theory, it's because women don't sense the C factor, which is the creep factor. Mm, mm -hmm. So it feels like a safe color. It somehow. feels like it's a safe color, yeah. which is funny because if a woman wears purple, uh, guys like kind of like will sister vibe you like you just feel like too friendly like oh i only see her as a friend that sort of <laughs> that's attitude. interesting so it's very wow. it's it's like a it's these are like little tests that we do at work to like see what colors are higher click-through rate and higher approach rate oh this is um, great i love but this. Anyway, you came in wearing green today and i was like oh wow she's like i'm just up. trying and to look it, like i'm full of vitality and really. she's like no it's here. because i went and spoke at the chief's office and that's their color and i was like oh it's my color <laughs> it matches my book cover too which is a yes. total accident but you know i want to i want to talk about the compliment thing for yeah, a second yeah, yeah. because that's something that most people feel very awkward about is giving somebody a compliment yeah and there's an entire study on this and i'll, I'll send you the citation if you want it for the show notes but interestingly most people feel very awkward about the idea of giving someone a compliment but in practice in theory once they do it it feels amazing to yes. the giver and amazing to the receiver there is totally. literally so no I, downside yeah all upside. Just say it. If you're thinking it, just don't overthink it. Don't, should I, should I not? Just blurt it out before you have time to stop yourself. You know, my, one of my little mantras, do it awkward, but do it anyway. Your compliment doesn't have to be perfectly formed. If you're just like, dope shoes. If that's all that comes yeah. out of your mouth. That's works. Done. You don't you need to it. overthink it. Just get it out. But it feels good on both sides. Don't, it doesn't have to be awkward. Just spit it out. So we have to fix our awkwardness. We have to lean into it. Because we need those tools in order to be vulnerable in our relationships. You can't get to vulnerability without the messy middle of awkwardness first. Sure. If you can't tolerate being imperfect, if you can't tolerate a tiny misstep, if you can't tolerate that little bit of uncertainty, then true vulnerability is always going to feel a little bit out of reach. I love that. I love that. I've been promoting the 5-5 five five challenge, and I know a lot of women are doing it. And one of those, the 5-5s. Five uh, and if you want to learn more, I'll include a link to that in the show notes. Uh, but one of those things in the five, five challenge is saying hi to five people mm, I love or it. swiping. Another one is like swiping on five people. You would have never swiped before. Like, I think that this is just such a fun opportunity to, for people to do those challenges and like learn more about themselves in the process. Yeah. And, and I think the key here is manage your expectations. If it feels awkward, guess what? It's supposed to. Right. That's it not a bad thing. No, it means that you're trying something. It means that you're a social human being. You know, I want you to thank your brain in that moment. I want you to say, thanks, brain. 
You're somebody who's looking for belonging. You're looking for social acceptance. You're doing exactly what you're designed to do. So thank you for keeping me as a healthy, functioning human. But I'm going to do this anyway. Mm. I'm going to do this anyway. But understand that if you feel awkward doing it, it's not because you're not ready or you don't have enough confidence. It's because you're human. It's the most universal emotion there is. The person that you aspire to be feels it when they're doing something edgy like that. They haven't learned to avoid it. They just learn to lean into it and keep going. I love that. Well, Henna, where can people find you? I am Henna Pryor on LinkedIn and Instagram are my two primary playgrounds, hennapryor.com. It takes you to my website for speaking, training, book stuff. And then uh, Good Awkward is the name of the book. The subtitle is How to Embrace the Embarrassing and Celebrate the Cringe to Become the Bravest You. And it's everywhere books are sold. And I'm also going to include a link in the show notes so you can follow Henna and also buy her book and gift her book because the holidays are coming and I just know there's someone who needs this. Awkward ask. Yes, please buy the book for the holidays. It's the perfect holiday book. It is the perfect holiday book. Hannah, thanks again for coming to the Ask a Matchmaker podcast. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening into the Ask a Matchmaker podcast or watching. I don't know if you know this, but we are on YouTube. So if you really like my facial expressions, well, let me tell you, you could find them here. Of course, You can always find out more about me and the services that my company provides by checking out the show notes. And as I end every show, be lovable, but more importantly, be likable. See you next week.